First, it's July 4th weekend. Hey, guys, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, please, to, um, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We're going to do a little, little diversion from our study in Romans because of this unique weekend, and we're going to receive communion. So Luke chapter 22, let's turn there at this time, and um, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. What a blessing to have you leading worship. Huge blessing. Wonderful to have your precious mother in the front row. I mean, is that your sister? It's your mom. And uh, we're so, thank you for being here. That was a, so listen, Luke chapter 22, and I want to pray one more time. Lord, I, I want to thank you for you. We love you, and I want to thank you for every person in this room, from the youngest to the eldest. I thank you. You're here with us, Lord, which is so, in, in, so beyond words that, um, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we, we see you by, by the lens of faith, which identifies for us really what reality is. You have said where we gather in your name, you are there. Of course, you're everywhere, but we are your sons and daughters, so I just thank you for your beautiful presence. Lord, what is it you'd like to say to us? Uh, how is it you'd like to bring comfort and edification and course correction and um, rescue, have your way. Lord, have your way. I pray we'd all leave here. It's just been so obvious that it was a time spent with you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Uh, and thank you, Lord, that whom, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Um, help us understand. What does that mean? Afresh to all of us. Thank you that, that you have not finished your work in us. In other words, you're you're, all, you're at work in our life, and yet we're complete in you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone who agreed said, Amen. So the title of the message is Faith and Freedom, a little subtitle. There's a connection between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, right? A big connection. We want to unpack it. But here we are, Luke chapter 22. You know, I came across these remarks recently by... One of our most four, uh, foremost fathers of, the, of our country. And of course, th there have been some great fathers of our country uh, that uh, spearheaded the foundation of our country. But then there were leaders among leaders. And, and John Adams is like definitely a leader among the leaders, a lawyer, super brilliant, credible communicator. But I really want you to listen to what he says there. Now, you're talking about incredible insight. Just check this out. Here's what he said. He said, I will insist that the Hebrews, the Hebrews have contributed more to civilized men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. They are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited the earth. The Romans and their empire were but a bubble in comparison to the Jews. Whoa! The most glorious nation in the history of man? The greatest influence to civilize the nations? I mean, come on. What does he mean by this? Why is he talking in such terms? Here's the answer, and I just want us to like let this soak in as best as possible right at, at the beginning of our message, and that is in the formation of the nation of Israel, like we have a formation of our country, obviously, right? But in the formation of the nation of Israel, there is the revelation of who God is. And God revealed himself in the formation of the nation of Israel. So you know, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I mean. God called Abraham out of a very dark place. And look, I'm going to show you a piece of real estate. And through you, I'm going to build a great nation, not an empire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a nation. In fact, the idea of a nation is Jewish. The idea of a nation goes back to the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm going to build a nation. It's a nation that has freedom of worship. It's going to influence the entire world through the Messiah of Israel. And watch this. Then you have this rescue of the people of Israel uh, in Egypt. I mean, they're under the thumb of this tyrannical leader, Pharaoh, who was going after the kids. I mean, Pharaoh was trying to destroy all male baby Jews, right? So he was after 
the kids. Let's just put it that way. And any influence that are after the kids, let me just say, is demonic. Flat out. So it's like, okay, Moses, what I want you to do, I want you to go into Egypt. I want you to tell that guy, let my people go. So you, you're like an evil dictator, not to mention the fact that you're inhibiting freedom of worship. You're not allowing them to worship. You need to let them go. So watch this. you got this call upon a man, piece of real estate, a nation, nation, nation. And this nation is going to impact the entire world. Then you got this rescue, rescue. It's called Passover. And then, of course, you have the children of Israel in the wilderness where the Lord meets them in a unique way, provides a, the law at Mount Sinai, enters a covenant with them, right? And then births a nation. The point is this. We have it on the screen how God revealed himself in the formation of the nation of Israel is actually essential for the civilizing of the nations of the world. You say, well, how so? Well, look, and if you're writing down notes, and we're going to have it on the screen as well, here's how this is a reality. Number one, the Lord God of Israel, super important, revealed the highest value and dignity to man. He created man in his image. That's no small thing. In fact, there's no understanding of who we are, self-understanding, unless we understand who God is. So he created us in his image. Every single human being, of course, beginning in the womb, all the way up into elder years, has intrinsic value having been created by Almighty God. Can I hear a big amen to that? Now, here's an alternative. The alternative is we're all a byproduct of mindless nature, and there's no authoritative reason for life, and, and there's no authoritative value attributed to humanity. And of course, this is the spirit of the age. I mean, this is what atheist Yuval Harari is actually trying to promote. He said, to the best of our scientific understanding, determinism and randomness have divided the entire cake between them, leaving not even a crumb for freedom. The sacred word freedom turns out to be just like soul, a hollow term empty of any discern, discernible meaning, free will exists only in the imaginary stories we humans have invented. What is he saying there? He is saying that humanity is a byproduct of mindless nature, merely a bio-machine. Now, what mankind is attempting to do is reach godhood by transhumanism. And he's one of the great prophets in that way of our day. Now, let's just be clear on something. Like, if Paul was here, uh, and we have, of course, his writings inspired by the Holy Spirit, he would say that creation provides for us undeniable evidence that there's a creator, an uncreated one who's always been, who made the entire universe. And man, he would say, is without excuse. Okay? You say, well, how so? Well, because the universe speaks of eternal muscle, and the universe, down to DNA, speaks of a mind, speaks of the Godhead, in intellect. And because of that, man is without excuse. Now, someone might say, well, you know, I just don't believe that. Um, and they, can, they have the choice to do that. But to be sincere in the belief doesn't make it right, right? You can be sincerely wrong. I mean, there is such a thing as fact-based truth. There is such a thing as revelation-based truth. And, and the Bible says that a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Look, I, I, don't, I, you know, I, I know there are individuals that claim to be atheists, and they have the right to do that. And I respect, seriously, their choice to, to hold that position. They say they don't believe in God. Here's my position. You ready for this? I actually don't believe in atheists, actually. Deep down inside, I believe. There is a little flicker down there that's saying there is Almighty God. I'm absolutely convinced of it. So just, just track with this. These are all like unique little nuances, but so important. It's like, wait, the revelation of God in the formation of the nation of Israel is no small thing. So what do we see? Oh, we see there's a God who created man in his image. Intrinsic value. Number two, the Lord God of Israel revealed the surest grounds for developing personal freedom. And that is in a right relationship with God. So it's like you really want to be free, right? You, you want to be rightly aligned with God. That's why it's like the Lord rescues his people out of enslavement 
this stinking Pharaoh who was after the kids, after undermining freedom of religion, right, rescues them, and when he brings them into the wilderness, he gives the Ten Commandments. The first one is, hey, I am the Lord who brought you out of enslavement, and I am to be your God. So it's like, okay, what's the key to personal freedom and liberty and growing to our full potential? Here, here's what it is. It's being rightly aligned with the one who created us. If, there, if there's misalignment, it throws everything off. And God created us, of course, for right boundaries, to bless and protect our lives. We know all of these things. But if we are misaligned, this is the surest way for full potential, shalom, wholeness, is like have the Lord, the eternal one, as God in our life. If that is off, it throws everything off on the horizontal level. It breaks down families. It leads to sexual immorality. It leads to like making material things, ultimate things. You know, and then Jesus said that man shall not live, or excuse me, he said that, uh, that your life is not in the abundance of what you possess. I mean, it just breaks, it, everything begins to break down. Author of the book, Domestic Extremist, critiquing the sexual revolution, penned pharmaceuticals and feminism have now turned at least two generations of young women into, this is a woman writing, I need to choose my words carefully, she says here, extremely affordable concubines. 99 cent escorts, human flesh lights for the price of a few drinks. Is this what liberation looks like? Of course it doesn't. That just looks like stinking wreckage, right? I mean, the wages of sin is death. So watch. Like, the formation of the nation of Israel, very, very important. What do we see about God? He reveals himself in the formation of a nation, in history, where we learn the intrinsic value of every human being. We learn the ground for personal freedom, which is right relation with God. And the third thing is, the Lord God of Israel revealed the surest ground for political freedom. And this is, this is where we transition to our founding fathers. See, they understood it's like they understood that God created man. And they understood that the ground for personal freedom is actually, it's going to be virtue, it's going to be morality, it's going to be, it's going to be in right alignment with Almighty God. And that's why you have in the Declaration of Independence, man, I'll tell you, these words are so powerful. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their, can someone tell me? creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Beautiful. That led to the Constitution. This is like so brilliant. I love this. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty, to ourselves and our posterity to do our deign and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And then you have the Emancipation Proclamation as Abraham Lincoln pens, all persons held as slaves within any state or part of state, the people whereof shall be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free, right? It's like our story is found in what? It's found in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, Emancipation Proclamation. If we lose our story, we lose our identity. But it's all rooted in the revelation of who God is and the formation of Israel. Because we also learn, we also learn from the Lord God of Israel a scathing critique of the abuse of powers. You know, God hates dictators. Dictators generally think they are God. God has confronted dictators through his servants throughout history. It's like Daniel confronting Nebuchadnezzar and he ends up repenting, turning to the Lord God of Israel. In fact, when the Lord returns, please hear this, he confronts a godless empire. It's like, so in the mind of our precious Lord, he's, he's very much very much interested in nations that provide liberty to their people without a few controlling 
the many. Are you guys with me on this? Does not like empires because there is going to be prior to the second coming of Jesus this one called the lawless one you know everything in opposition to almighty God spearheading a one world government one world religion who thinks he is God right it's like that's the spirit of the age it's always been around there's no doubt about it but now technology is facilitating it he's called the antichrist and when the Lord returns he judges him and judges unrighteousness among the nations. Point number two is America was formed by the revelation of God in the formation of the nation of Israel. Highest value and dignity to the individual created in the image of God. Freedom is not man's idea, it's God's idea. The surest grounds to develop personal freedom, which is right relationship with God, surest foundation for political freedom and God's hatred of dictators who think they are God. Now, look, this leads us to the third point, and that is, um, and I have like 20 points, so just hang in there. No, I'm just kidding. No, I actually think I only have four. But, but here's this leads us to number three, and that is understanding our country's foundation provides perspective to what's happening today. Uh, and, and that is, we see, we see major breakdown, and, it, and it's only accelerating, and it's not hyperbolic to say. I mean, I'm so concerned. You know, talking about like Pharaoh going after the kids, I'm just so concerned about the crazy indoctrination we talk about all the time of our state going after kids beginning in kindergarten with gender confusion, all this insanity. I mean, it's just insane. Okay, you, you have to understand that America, America was inspired by the revelation of who God is in the formation of Israel. Can I hear an amen to that, right? So so this is our story. But what's happening today, more and more, is that our country is not being informed by the American Revolution. It's being informed by the French Revolution. And this revolution is anti-biblical, anti-God. It's like atheistic. It, It inspired the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. And it promotes a different freedom. Like sometimes when I hear, if I could just say, like I'm just trying to figure it out like everybody else, but when I hear certain leaders, I'll be frank with even our president, when he talks about freedom, it's a different freedom than I'm thinking. It's a, it's a freedom, it goes way too far. Way too far. Um, it's a freedom that is rooted in a freedom from God, which is not our story as a country, actually. Which means there's no authoritative purpose, plan, or meaning in life. So what is this freedom, therefore? It's a freedom that wants to dismantle all categories, blur all boundaries, dissolve all clarity, erode all certainties, only to end in a skepticism, incoherence, chaos, and anxiety that is not, is not livable. It just, just brings stinking breakdown. And this new freedom, uh, this new freedom, which is after just deconstructing everything, gives rise to a new dictator. And this dictator says, if you don't bow, I'm going to cancel you. So it's like, hey, look, at you know, I'm going to put some fear in you if you don't speak the truth or you're standing for righteous boundaries. But listen, Christians don't bow to dictators. Can I hear an amen to that? Just don't bow. No, we just like, we, we worship the true and living God. You know, the last day of the Constitutional Convention, September 18, 1787, you guys know the story. We talk about it often, but Mrs. Powell of Philadelphia asked Benjamin Franklin, well, Dr., uh, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm speaking in tongues right there. And um, Benjamin, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin said, a, a republic, if you can keep it, right? If you can keep it. Os Guinness identified the triangle of freedom, and it was popularized, of course, by our dear friend Eric Metaxas, with this idea that freedom requires virtue. And virtue requires faith, and faith requires freedom. 
So in other words, if there's going to be freedom, you're going to live your full potential. You need virtue. We've, we mentioned this many times, but virtue is morality. Virtue is right boundaries, right? It's like lines on the highway. So if you remove the lines on the highway, you just have total devastation. So you, you need virtue, which is absolutely essential. And if you don't have virtue or morality with right boundaries, you're actually going to then uh, promote more laws that will restrict your freedom, actually. And we're witnessing this today in plain sight. Uh, we have brewing in California today is that really, really a, a po policies that are, I would say, inspired by gender dysphoria, which, is a, which of course is a struggle that people can have, which is a confusion with regard to their gender. It, it is, I would say, a mental illness. I mention this because it's actually, though, leading policy in our state. And by nature, it is therefore a Trojan horse. It will empower the state to remove children from their parents and their families. Um, Admiral Rachel Levine in the Biden administration um, is actually promoting this. So he's marketing this, that gender-affirming care, blocking puberty, removing genitals, adding, you know, all this crazy stuff. I can't believe I'm even reading this, right? I mean, uh, you know, including children, mentally health. Anyways, um, he's promoting this idea. I, I, I was reading an exclusive interview in the Daily Mail uh, that revealed that a mother in Los Angeles um, had, had her daughter, of course, in school, and she was being counseled, essentially, that, you know, you know maybe she has same-sex attraction, and then it led to confusion with regard to uh, her, her sex, and, you know, maybe you need to make the transition, so it led to taking all these hormones and things like this, and eventually this daughter threw herself on an oncoming train and, and obviously killed herself, right? And, and Mrs. Martinez said that her daughter was murdered by a gender ideology, okay? But she testifies that this was taking place behind the scenes. She was not aware of, of the indoctrination that was taking place, that what was really happening in her daughter's life was she was dealing with extreme depression. So look, you can better understand why Benjamin Franklin said only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. So you need virtue, which provides right boundaries. Faith, what is faith? Well, well faith is being informed by the truth of who God is. Um, so it's, it's, it's it, and, as, and as a result, it ends up impacting our life, needless to say, providing those right boundaries. And then you have freedom. Freedom would be the freedom, in this case, the freedom of worship. So look, virtue is essential. Faith fuels virtue. And then you need a society that is free to actually worship, right? All absolutely critical. That is the triangle of freedom. Atheist Joseph Stalin, who was responsible for countless millions of his fellow Russians, to, uh, you know, like we're talking about some 10, 20 million uh, deaths, he said this, America is like a healthy body, and its resistance is threefold, its patriotism, its morality, and its spiritual life. If we can undermine these areas, America will collapse from within. Of course, of course it will. I mean, virtue is essential. Faith is essential. Freedom of worship is essential. And um, I'll just tell you, I just think of what Solomon penned. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, the winner of the 1970 Nobel Prize for Literature, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, gave an address in London years ago Trying to just encapsulate what took place, you know, among his people and nation. He said, over a half century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of old people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. And they would say, men have forgotten God. And that's why all of this has happened. He said, since then I have spent, well, 
now 50 years working on the history of our revolution. And in the process, I've read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own toward the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible from the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million people, I could not put it more accurately than to simply repeat, men have forgotten God. And that's why all of this has happened. So look, here's the thing. Here's reality, okay? God revealed himself, the true and living God, in the formation of the nation of Israel. And the revealing of who he is, because like we have no idea who we are unless we know who he is, totally inspired the thinking of our founding fathers. It laid a foundation for our nation. No doubt about it. So we celebrate the American Revolution, not the French Revolution. But it's the French Revolution, unfortunately, that is informing predominantly our culture today. That's perspective to the unique context of our time and the incredible country in which which we live in, that could go back to the revelation of Almighty God in the formation of Israel. Now, you guys, check this out. Would you believe it if I told you that not only our nation came into being inspired by the revelation of God in the formation of Israel, but that our salvation, too, is rooted in the unfolding story of Israel? Because it is. See, let's, let's look at Luke chapter 22. And then we'll just prepare our hearts to receive communion. I mean, what's happening here in in Luke 22? This is a passage we often refer to, and so we should. But notice in verse 7 it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, and he said, Go prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. Now there's a lot going on here. I don't want to like get lost in some of the technicalities, but bear with me. Okay, first of all, unleavened bread is actually on the biblical calendar, Nisan 15. Passover itself, which celebrates a historical day of deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, is Nisan 14. So it's like, to, it, it's like Israel's July 4th, the great Independence Day, out of enslavement. We, we know this, right? And, but, bear with me, unleavened bread is also a reference to Passover. So I don't want to confuse you. And a, the week of Passover, which is the celebration. Are you guys tracking with me? If you just tracked with that, you are a genius, okay? <laughs> and you're reading my mind and filling in all the gaps. Okay, so let me just boil it down. This is the day our Lord is going to give his life on the cross. So historically, it's kind of Israel's July 4th. It's it's independence from enslavement, right? 1,300 years later, the same day, Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross. He's going to bring the new exodus out of enslavement to impact the entire world, right? So that's the context here. And, And it says in verse 10, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Maybe you're like new to the Bible and you're thinking, wait a second, you just said Passover is like July 4th, Independence Day. Yes. The Passover is actually also a meal. And that's actually a meal that commemorates, it's celebrating. Well, we're going to have, like we're going to celebrate our July 4th, right? And, um, and July 4th is more than just eating a hot dog and holding a little, sp- you know, sparkler, right? And you're just like, it's more than that. It's rooted in a story, right? It's rooted in a great deliverance. It goes all the way back to the revelation of the formation of Israel. I mean, it's just more than that. So what you have is they're eating a meal, and we're going to have a little part of that meal in just a little bit, a really small part of it. But we're not going to forget its context. The context is critical to its meaning. 
So they're going to have this extensive meal celebrating just great deliverance. And, and actually, this historical day was a preview and prophecy of, of something in the future that is going to take place. And it's in this context that you have Jesus, and we'll just jump up to verse 15. He says, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, gave thanks, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Pause here real quick. Look up here. Okay, this is huge. Like, I mean, obviously... He's talking about something's going to happen. Um, there's going to be a break. He's not, going to ha- he's not going to celebrate July 4th with them for a long time. He's not going to be present physically with Passover, celebrating Israel's history, God's unfolding plans. Uh, and there's going to be a break. He's going to suffer. But then what he does here is just like off the charts. It's like he's either the Lord or he is a lunatic to do what he does here. Because he says in verse 19, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Whoa! Listen, Passover is the story that that tells who God is, God's plan and purpose in and through Israel to impact the entire world. And now Jesus is actually identifying himself as the central figure of God's unfolding plan. Can I hear a big amen to that? That's huge. So when you have this meal now, you know, just in the bread, it's my body broken. And from my death will come life. And you're going to partake. We're all going to partake of a little bit. Unleavened bread. And it's, it's, it's like it's, it speaks of so many things. From his brokenness, of course, it came life. From his brokenness came a community, a, the body of Christ, uh, I'm going to eat some. You're going to eat some. We're one with Christ. We're one with each other. We're in a kingdom that will never break down. Can I hear another big amen? That that's like, oh, God, I thank you, Lord. And then, he's, then he takes, of course, the cup, and he identifies the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. We listened this morning. We're going to hold the bread in just a little bit. And it speaks to us of many things. One, it speaks to us of our Lord's precious body. It speaks of his life. You know, he was, he was whipped. We, we are convinced of this. They, they would use the, what's called the cat of nine tails. And when they would crucify someone, they would sentence them to be crucified. Then they would torture them to elicit any confession of any other crimes that they have committed, right? So the likelihood of our Lord being beaten like 39 times, they would beat him 40 times on his back, opening of his back. Prophecy said that you couldn't even, like he was so brutalized, he, he, he wasn't even recognizable. The strong likelihood that he experienced the full brunt of the sadistic, insane evil is just like high. And the Bible prophesied that from his stripes, we are healed. So just listen, this morning, it's like we're going to just all soberly and beautifully just take in uh, the remembrance of the greatest demonstration of love because the Lord was in full control. No one took his life. He laid it down for us. It wasn't those nails that kept him on the cross. It was his love for you and his love for me, his love for all of us. And listen, he wants us to be a good receiver of that. You know, and, and this is so critical to freedom. You talk about personal freedom and living your full potential. You need to know afresh the Lord is madly in love with you. And once he comes into our life, I mean, you are positionally secure. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are empowered. You have new identity in him. And that blood, oh my goodness gracious, that blood, that blood speaks of extraordinary Power. I mean, just think of the Lord calling forth Lazarus from the grave. Lazarus, come forth. Here's a dead man, right? And he walks out of the tomb. And he still has these grave clothes. And the Lord instructs to help, for people to help him get those grave clothes off. But look, the point is, is the Bible tells us that by the blood of Jesus, we overcome 
The Bible says, and they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. Death has no power over us. Satan has no power over us in Jesus Christ. Listen, we're free. And we're free to make right choices and grow to our full potential. And so it's like, I wouldn't be surprised you're going to hear the Lord speak to you afresh like he did Lazarus who heard his name. It's like he's going to say, you know, Greg, that's me, of course. Greg, I want you to step out of that tomb. I want you to step out of the hey, Listen, you keep moving forward. I'm not finished with you yet. There's no sin that I haven't forgiven. There's no sin or addiction that I have not over come, that I want you to step into my victory that I've already provided for you. C.S. Lewis said, on the back of Satan's neck is a nail-scarred footprint. I love that. The Lord conquered the enemy. And be assured, there's no sin you have committed that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cleanse. So, look, this morning we celebrate we celebrate the Lord's unfolding plan that will never be stopped. Um, this, this plan from eternity past to eternity future in and through Israel and the Messiah of Israel, the Davidic King, this unstoppable plan. So, look, I didn't say this morning that, that our country is the kingdom of God. I didn't even never said that, and, and I'm sure you're not even thinking that. So why am I bringing that up? I just want to make a point. That is our salvation, right? Our salvation, our assurance of citizenship in this kingdom, right, has been assured to us by the Davidic king of Israel, the Messiah, the anointed one. So listen, I want you to find, and hopefully you already have your bread, your, your little cup, you know, your little pre-made cup, and um, I want you to find that at this time, and we can kind of start to undo it, or unwrap it, I should say. So at the top, you'll notice, just hang in there, at the top, you'll notice this little wafer. I mean, it's not my favorite. I like, you know, I like unleavened bread that's striped and pierced. But we, uh, we kind of implemented this last minute, so we went to these pre-packages. But I want you to identify the bread. See this little wafer here? And, um, and, let's, and I want us, let's partake of communion together, and then we'll sing. But let's partake together. So uh, just find the bread. Let's start with the bread. Let's start with the bread. And we're going to remain in an attitude of prayer. So let me pray. We'll just settle our souls here in our hearts. So Lord, Lord, as we hold this bread in our hands, I'm sorry, we'll wait just a little bit. Yeah, it's a little, it could be a little deceptive to get that bread out. Did everybody get their bread out? Almost. No, no. It's, no. I understand. They need to do better with this bread as far as I'm concerned. It's like, I don't know what this is. Hopefully it's unleavened. Yeah. This is not the Greek Orthodox Church. Okay, here we go. Everybody got it? No, let's, let's, let, let's, let's, let's pray together. Let's, shh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we will never forget you. We love you. And, you know, this, this bread that we're holding in our hands um, that is light and fragile um, and easily broken, uh, we, we will never forget you were broken. You were pierced. You were beaten. We'll never forget it. And sweating drops of blood in Gethsemane. Ah, uh, needing comfort, You're needing the comfort of Peter, James, and John, uh, them falling asleep. Just, Lord, we'll never forget your personal suffering. We'll, we'll never, we'll never forget that loneliness. We'll never forget your face in the ground uh, under so much duress that it, it could have killed you, as Scripture says. 
We'll never forget it. And uh, I just pray by the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we hold the bread symbolic of your body, which is broken for us in a few moments, partaking of it, becoming a part of our body, quite literally, becoming a part of the DNA, so to speak, of our body. That we just thank you, we're one with you, we believe it. And we declare you're the Savior and the King. And one day on planet Earth, the demonstration of righteousness and the destruction of evil will take place. We believe it. You're the answer. In the meantime, we are so blessed to be your body. And I just want to thank you for those beautiful church family here, by the way. We're so blessed and we pledge our commitment to the unity of the body of Christ, majoring on the majors, not the minors. As you have said, you'll know my disciples by the love that they have for one another. So we love you and we commit ourselves to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake just of the bread at this time. And then I'm going to pray we'll partake of the...